the Shelter in Solidarity, a deep dive with artists, activists, and authors during this ongoing COVID pandemic. I'm one of your co-hosts tonight, Joe Ramsey, Zooming with you from Dorchester, Massachusetts on the south side of Boston. And I am joined by my co-host, Rachel. Rachel, are you there? Hi, it's great to be here with you all. Great, Rachel, it's a pleasure to be uh, co-hosting with you tonight. I know this is not your first time doing it on Shelter and Solidarity. You have been holding down with Kira Mudliar uh, and others, our new weekend edition um, of the show, a once a month weekend romp with new authors of important books for the left. Uh, tonight, we are here on a Tuesday night, uh, not our usual Thursday and not the weekend show. And we're here for a very special reason. Uh, for a show to help promote and to begin and deepen dialogue with the upcoming post-capitalist conference focused on building the solidarity economy. And we are really, if I may introduce them briefly, really privileged and blessed to have with us tonight uh, two representatives of that conference who have been helping to organize out in California and internationally via Zoom. We're joined again, returning to Shelter and Solidarity by David Cobb, um, a well-known national organizer, spokesman, activist. Um, he is, among other roles, the director of Cooperation Humboldt out of California and um, is a leader in the U.S. Solidarity Eco uh, Economy Network. That's the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. David, are you there? Howdy, y'all. It's great to have you with us. Um, and again, back on Shelter and Solidarity. Uh, I, I always put out the call, uh, you know, uh, are you there? Because as, as we all know on here on Zoom, you can only be seen when you are heard. And to those audience members who are joining us but are not featured guests at this moment, um, be aware that if you are heard, you'll be seen as well. So, so please do keep yourself muted uh, during the early part of the program, as we always do here on Shelter and Solidarity, around the 45 minute to hour mark, we like to open it up for your questions and comments for David, um, for and for our next guest as well, uh, Nicola Walters. Uh, Nicola, uh, it's good to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much, Joe, appreciate it. Nicola is a labor organizer, uh, an organizer of a particular group of workers, faculty in California, uh, in, uh, involved with the California Faculty Association, an organizer also teaches politics as a professor at Humboldt State University, and has been working with Cooperation Humboldt in relationship to preparing this really looks like a fascinating conference. Again, po the post-capitalist conference, something I think many of us are hungry for, um, whether we know it or not. Um, so thank you again to both of you for being here tonight. You bet. Terrific. So we want to start with a softball question, right? I mean, we were doing this Tuesday show for you. Dave, I mean, David is the one who, you know, kind of reached out to us and building on our previous collaboration. Like, can we do a show on a Tuesday since we have a, you have a conference, I think, starting on Thursday and running through the weekend. Uh, David, so what is going on here? And, and, and uh, Nicola, I'd like to welcome you into that question too. I'm learning more about your, the role you've played as an organizer of this on various sides. So what's happening this weekend? Uh, why should people care about it and be willing to get back on their computers for another number of hours, you know, in this pandemic Zoom fest we're having? Uh, what's going on out there? What's important about it? And uh, what do people need to know right off the bat? So I think I'll start with the big picture and then uh, pass it to my colleague, uh, Nicola. So uh, the re reality is, Joe and Rachel, I reached out to Shelter and Solidarity because y'all have been doing a phenomenal job of merging art, culture, political organizing, specifically during the COVID pandemic. And frankly, I wanted to utilize and build on the network that you're building for this conference. And this conference, why should people care about it? Let's be blunt, because capitalism as an economic system is literally going to destroy the planet if we do not interrupt it. And there is a growing network of organizers, practitioners who are doing work that we call the solidarity economy, what is often known as non-reformist reforms, but it's still mostly disconnected. So this conference is a place where both theorists, academics, practitioners, and organizers can come together and build a sort of a rhizomic network of networks of folks that are doing similar kind of work. 
And I reached out to some of the key folks at Humboldt State University to ask if they would be willing to co-host it. And Nicola and Tony Salvaggio were the two faculty uh, that really just jumped right in. Yeah, I think I'll jump in right there too, actually, David, because I think that, you know, one of the things that you were highlighting, Joe, is that when we're talking about, hey, shoot, you know, everyone's getting on Zoom these days or feels like most of their work or a lot of their obligations are all circulating around Zoom as a platform. But I really think that, you know, David is doing a fantastic job of highlighting that there is urgency for this conference. But not only that, when we're talking about, you know, kind of, thinking about taking a pause to get on Zoom, it's actually, we're sort of doing the opposite of asking people to pause. We're saying, instead of pausing, you know, jump in, get involved. And a lot of folks are looking for something that can, you know, really help them to take whatever they're feeling, the anxiety, the grief, the stress, the frustration, the uncertainty of this time, and find actual methods, practices, solutions that can help them not only in the short term, but move their community as well into a space that can continue to provide, you know, healing and enriching type of, uh, you know, social support. And that's exactly what the conference aims to do. So it's kind of like, we're not asking people to, to say, oh, shoot, you know, you, you have to divert from your life to jump on Zoom. It's like, actually, if you're unhappy with what's going on and you believe that there's something else that we should be steering our world towards, that's what this uh, conference provides. And it's an opportunity for people more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, from talking to David um, prior to this um, episode, I learned that this is, your conference is built into it. One of my favorite features for conferences, uh, which is it's, it's no, no concurrent sessions, right? Which mm -hmm. is to say, you're actually trying to, as I understand it, build, imagine this academia, you know, uh, or the political left for that matter, to build continuity of conversation mm -hmm. over time that allows people to deepen and follow up on, on connections and points that come up rather than a bunch of competing sessions. You know, you go to an event that actually has thousands of people at the left forum, you may end up in a room that makes you feel like you're alone, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So could you say a little more about some of the different tendencies and groups or just, I mean, I know it's more than you can summarize. You can point people to the program and we will put that in the chat box or you can do it yourself. But could you say a little bit about, you know, um, I guess both what is coming together here, if you can give us some kind of particularity, some concreteness of like some of the different strains or people or, uh, you know, groups that are that are coming together and also maybe a little bit about how that happened, maybe more of an organizing question, how, how it's come together, you know, uh, obviously when there's a need, uh, there's always a possibility of something happening, but it doesn't necessarily happen on its own, as I'm sure you know. So could you tell us a little bit about who and what's coming together as you understand it, that maybe you're particularly excited about, um, Obviously, you can't speak to everything you're excited about here, but and then and then then a little bit about how it did. Uh, back to David for that, and then and then Nicola. So I think what I'll do is just sort of get, uh, do a little bit of big picture. One, we've got some really uh, heavy hitters coming. Quite frankly, uh, Rick Wolf, who I suspect uh, viewers of Shelter and Solidarity already know, is one of the preeminent economists uh, of our time, certainly on the left, uh, famous for uh, democracy at work. We also have Emily Kawano of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, a, a noted both academic and practitioner, uh, really uh, one of the founders of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. But wait, there's more. We have Trinity Tran, who is uh, the leader in the public banking movement, both in California and nationally. Uh, we have Chase Iron Eyes of the Lakota I Indian Law Project. Uh, we have Mike Strode of the Koala Nut Collaborative. We have David Corton, author of When Corporations Rule the World and founder of Yes Magazine uh, and a host of others. Uh, but I wanna give the space uh, to Nicola to also talk about some of the really amazing uh, sessions that both you are organizing yourself and that you might be excited about that you're gonna be participating in. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been an amazing process of bringing together, you know, folks who have really been movers and shakers of these particular themes that, of course, you know, if we're going to have a conference to talk about post-capitalism, we wanted to have them involved in that conversation. But, you know, it's been a, a like with organizing, it's so interesting because I think that you always are finding that you have people that kind of come into these different pockets together and are like, oh, this person or oh, this, and it kind of has a lot of fire to it that sort of builds with the, you know, the interest and the involvement and how people are co uh, collaborating and recognizing, you know, shared participation on a lot of different levels. So uh, for myself, you know, I'm a faculty member. So when I think about like the majority of the work that I'm doing these days, even though I come out of political, social and environmental organizing, I've met a lot of these organizers in different kinds of action movements across this country. Um, but I was more thinking about the California faculty uh, perspective, because there are a lot of people that have been through the CFA, the California Faculty Association, involved with a lot of different work that talks about, you know, academic capitalism, for instance, or a topic that's really important right now, and that's organizing in higher education. Uh, and so how do we kind of bring people in? So uh, it's cool because we have folks that are on those types of panels that are really talking about their work and bringing their expertise together to share. But then we also have faculty members who are teachers of other incredible, you know, and necessary uh, practices that are really helpful and providing a lot of life to the uh, to the conference. Uh, one person that I would highlight would be Nikki Mehta, who will be really helping us on Friday to kind of sit with a lot of our emotions of this uncertain time. I mean, it's Tuesday. I mean, we just had, you know, George Floyd's trial take place in Minnesota. I mean, I know for myself, I'm feeling a lot of emotions kind of bubbling up throughout today. And that's not unique. I think folks are definitely, you know, talking about how they need sometimes safe spaces to sit with their grief and process emotions. So on Friday morning from nine to 10, uh, her session is invite your emotions to tea. And uh, she has this kind of uh, practice to help us to have awareness and uh, look at the emotions that are kind of ruling our own minds. Or if you're struggling with ecological grief, I mean, looking at how capitalism is destroying the earth. Uh, we have uh, Laura Johnson on Saturday morning leading a yoga class for ecological grief specifically. So a real strong practice for grounding and embodiment will be happening from 8.30 to 10 a.m. So, I mean, I just highlight some of those pieces because we have the theoretical, but we also have the practical. And then we have a lot of the personal that is necessary to really dig in and do this kind of work. Oh, that's and I'll take this opportunity also, Joe, just to, so thank you so much, Nicola. And uh, the, some of the very concrete uh, parts I wanna highlight, uh, Nicholas yeah. mentioned it, but we will be talking specifically about non-reformist reforms. That is things that are within Overton's window right now. That is that are happening and can happen and can be built upon things like public banking, participatory budgeting, community land trust, worker owned cooperatives, universal basic income, uh, locally owned energy production and distribution models. And I also, on the community land trust front, want to share that we here at Cooperation Humboldt are partnering with the Wiat tribe, uh, the land upon which I sit, the ancestral homeland of the Wiat, uh, are still here. The tribe is federally recognized, and we are literally creating an indigenous-led community land trust, as in four of the seven members of the board of directors will be designated by the Wiat tribe. Uh, to engage in regenerative economic development, specifically to re-indigenize this place. Uh, Michelle and I will be talking about that session uh, on the opening on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And of course, Thursday is Earth Day. So what better way to have an Earth Day uh, than to come with us? In fact, honestly, Joe and Rachel, this entire session was uh, the brainchild from it originally was from discussions around how to think about the period from Earth Day to May Day. And this, this sort of conference emerged out of those conversations. Well, I think that's great. I mean, connecting Earth Day and May Day and, and also connecting kind of academia, the university and kind of, you know, practical practitioners, you know, in the local community as well as beyond, uh, really exciting, uh, breaking down these barriers, really, you know, these, uh, these artificial 
inherited divisions, right? And helping us shed that and maybe create the basis for something new. I think Rachel has the next question for you. So I want to ask you to dive a little bit deeper into those non-reformist reforms. How do we differentiate them from reformist reforms that are just putting a Band-Aid on issues? And then also, how can we use current movements that are pushing for reforms right now and harness them and sort of use the momentum that's already happening to push for more fundamental change? Nicola, would you like to take that first? I, I want you to do the non-reformist reforms, and then I want to talk about movements. <laughs> You got it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, and it's a great question, Rachel, and I really appreciate it because, you know, uh, honestly, uh, five, 10 years ago, a lot of the reforms, uh, if uh, I, I actually personally didn't get involved with them because I was, I thought of myself as a serious revolutionary and I was playing for the big picture and I, I stayed in that sort of space. And what I have learned, because I think all of us, I hope we're all like continuously learning, continuously uh, trying to improve our praxis. What I really came to realize, Rachel, is uh, I don't ever want to get involved in just pure reforms and stay there. But a non-reformist reform is one that, yes, like other reforms can be achieved right here, right now, can make people's lives materially better, result in concrete, practical, pragmatic solutions, and by the nature of the reform itself can undermine the logic of capitalism, can undermine and erode the superstructure. Uh, as good Marxists, we know the superstructure can be eroded by some of these non-reformist reforms. That's why we'll take public banking as an example, Rachel. Like public banking can coexist within the capitalist system. So it is as important a reform as it is, it's still just a reform. I would argue it's a non-reformist reform because it begins to democratize the financial system. So when I talk about and think about non-reformist reforms, it's only in the context of saying that we're not saying that that one reform is the answer. Ultimately, we have to restructure social, political, and economic institutions. We need a new superstructure. So that's how I think about non-reformist reforms. And the second part with, uh, I was laughing about because I'm like, oh, this is gets to be me. I mean, since I teach political science, this is one of the things that I enjoy so much in my classroom is I talk a lot of, with my students uh, because I teach American government, I teach California government, and I teach environmental politics. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been involved with different kinds of movements across uh, this country. And so one thing that I find so inspiring is that a lot of times we try to, we think about movements really separately and we'll say, oh, this was the labor movement. Oh, this was the women's movement. Oh, this is environmentalism. But a lot of times what is so vibrant about these movements is how they actually coalesce and we have these kinds of uh, hybridization efforts that occur. I mean, some prime examples of that are thinking about Earth Day. I mean, Earth Day was actually largely financed and supported by the United Auto Workers. They gave a huge, tremendous backing to that initial Earth Day when we had in back in 1970. Um, when we think about how in 1999, the WTO protests came together, we had what we refer to as the Green Blue Alliance, looking at the environmental movement and steel workers, unionized workers that were coming together and standing in unity with environmental fundamentalists against what was happening with corporate America. And today, when we start thinking about, you know, some of the times that we've seen things occurring, you know, even when we're looking at environmentalism in a more kind of contemporary way or being out at Standing Rock, you know, that was when I had a chance to see and meet Chase Iron Eyes and have an opportunity to like really see these kind of intersections of labor and environmental efforts in a little bit of a different way. And that totally fuels how I approach uh, my faculty position and how I organize organized faculty labor because this dichotomy of environmentalism, you know, our humans and the earth, like labor and the environment, it's not really there. That's actually, you know, these are two sides of the same coin. They're completely connected to one another. And when we start recognizing that in challenging these kinds of assumptions requires looking at uh, the movements that are bubbling up today and the issues that they bring to the surface that we can't do any single thing without recognizing the needs of our you know our our members 
our organizers and the very real needs of our earth as well. So when I think about like harnessing energies, it's more like how do we incorporate, learn and grow together? And I really think that that kind of goes along with David's thinking of that kind of uh, unsettling the logics that are really problematic and detrimental that we're trying to counteract with a post-capitalism type conference. So for people in our audience who aren't familiar, could you just really quickly give um, like an explicit description of how you understand the solidarity economy and how it can sort of um, act as a web that connects these movements that like only grow stronger by growing in relation to one another? Yeah, I think well, that are really, I'll go for it, go David. <laughs> well, as the co-coordinator of the US Solidarity Economy Network, uh, I thought I, what I would do is sort of take that head on because it is actually a framework that comes out of a study of, I mean, economists created it. And in order to do it, Rachel, I'm going to juxtapose it with capitalism, because a lot of people feel like, oh, capitalism is too hard to understand, or it's it's super complex. Uh, and I'm going to do this knowing and seeing that Victor Wallace is actually uh, in the audience. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be on my best behavior here, because Victor is really, you know, a, a, a real leader uh, in this analysis. But here's what I'm going to say. Capitalism is actually very easy to understand according to its definition, right? Uh, and there are five key characteristics. And these characteristics you'll find in any uh, introductory college textbook on macroeconomics. One, the private ownership of the means of production. It's not just factories, but farms and fisheries, you know, uh, the, the, but they're privately owned. Number two, that goods and services are produced as commodities to be bought and paid for, uh, as opposed to just immediate human need or use. Number three, that those commodities are bought and paid for at a profit, so otherwise known as profit maximization. Number four, that labor itself is merely another commodity to be bought and paid for. And number five, it's our all allocated by the market. Now I say that, Rachel, because those five characteristics are how they're talked about. It shouldn't actually surprise anybody. And here's the thing. When you understand the implications of those five characteristics, it literally leads to unlimited growth. It leads to infinite growth on a finite planet. That's why with industrialization, we're seeing that literally uh, this economic system is destroying the planet faster than Mother Earth can replenish herself. So it's literally, literally the ideology of the cancer cell. Compare that to the Solidarity Economy Network which also has a framework or definitions. Number one, cooperation instead of competition. Number two, equity across all dimensions, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender. Uh, number three, a commitment to participatory processes. Basically, if a decision affects your life, you ought to be able to actively participate in making it. Number four, a commitment to deep ecology or sustainability. Uh, we put planet before profit. And then lastly, and here's the key, y'all, pluralism, an understanding that there are many pathways to that end goal. The solidarity economy framework is not rigid. It's not dogmatic. Yeah, that's fantastic to break down those two different, you know, important ways of kind of like looking at these two different worlds. Um, what I wanted to kind of just offer is a thought of, you know, what if you engaged in a community in a world that wasn't just hell bent on exploiting you for a profit? Like that's sometimes I think when we break down some of these kinds of, you know, pieces, we're like, what does it really look like in practice? If, you know, Nicola is a teacher and she doesn't work at a institution that during a pandemic is trying to exploit her for her work, you know, uh, is trying to reduce her economic 
viability, you know, my economic comfort is also trying to push me in a position where I'm off of health care and unable to care for myself and my family and my community because of the concerns of a pandemic. This is what happens when we have major corporations and very like corporate uh, exploitive types of systems that are just looking at what's the most we can get out of this person, not even looking at me as an individual, as a whole human, but as a line item if I even make it there. <laughs> Usually I'm lumped together, right? And it's like, well, we can just trim this down and we can make these reductions and we can just continue to rebuild our reserves so that we have a demonstration of our own profitability as an institution. But at the same, but then like the actual very real needs of the people that make that whole thing work in an education system are looked at as really an externality, a means to an end. So it's kind of like, what would it look like if we weren't looked at as a means to an end? How would we feel about each other? How would that change the way that our communities function and operate? And that's really sometimes like, you know, it, it seems kind of like theoretical in some ways, but it's just like really practical because we know what it looks like when we value the things around us for being a part of the, you know, just the web of our lives that we have appreciation for it, but we kind of forget about that when it's changed or kind of, you know, uh, put into a, a, you know, kind of space where it's, it's not given that kind of, uh, you know, flexibility or freedom to be really looked at as like a whole piece of the picture. Great. There's so much rich material on, you know, on the, um, that you all are raising here and, uh, you know, and, uh, and you've been raising it in other places too. I mean, David, I, uh, Rachel, and I both had a chance to watch your uh, appearance on with Lee Camp uh, a couple of weeks ago, also promoting this conference. And I was struck by a couple of you know the formulations, you know, like the uh, the kind of toolkit language you're using in that interview, and then building on some of the concepts you're elaborating at greater length here. But you know, kind of in, in the line of the pluralism, the non kind of dogma dogmatism. I mean, you 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 actually said something I, I've been saying a lot lately too. Is like with the left, you know, in the United States often can, and maybe academia in its own way too, can fall into um, a kind of either or way of talking about change, right? And you kind of put forth a both and kind of approach rather than an either or, right? Which doesn't mean there isn't debate, right? And struggle. And you also talk about not just the need to talk about, the need to not talk about not only the to overthrowing capitalism, but overgrowing it, right, as well, which I think is really powerful. And another formulation, which is one I wanna zoom in right now, for both of you is this, this notion you had of failing forward, right? The idea of like not being afraid of failure and like the idea of teaching people to like try to be perfect and not get involved until they know everything, which I think is another tendency that is in, in the left in various ways and in academia in other ways. And of course those two circles overlap but are not identical. Can you talk a little more about what you meant by failing forward? And I also wanted to ask this, like what is some of the failing forward that has actually brought you, you know, individually or collectively, to this place, and 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 I wanted to ask that to Nicola too, in terms of maybe the question of the role of academia, um, you know, because I mean, when you were giving this really, I think, compelling narrative about how Earth Day that had, you know, and the, the environmental justice movement, which is so like such had such a working class labor aspect to it, you know, get kind of somehow gets segregated out, right, and split off, you know, environmentalism and labor studies are different departments. And I kind of wondered, you know, if you had some thoughts about the role academia has actually played in creating some of these silos that now we're, you know, trying to overcome, break out of, overgrow, and, and you know, and, and how we can, like, I don't know what that struggle looks like, you know, as someone who's clearly straddling both sides of the kind of activist organizing academic divide that isn't a divide or shouldn't be a divide, like how you think about the tensions that and challenges that come up in trying to like talk to academics about getting involved in a conference like this or the kind of practices that this conference is, is, is feeding or hoping to feed. Um, I know that's kind of two questions here, but one is about like failing forward. You know, what do you mean by that concept, David? And like, can you maybe talk about the failing forward to this point? And maybe we can talk about how can we fail forward in academia, you know? It, with respect sure. to projects like this? So uh, I'll unpack it quickly and say this, that I think that too, too many on the left have gotten very comfortable with critique and description of the problem. And honestly, what I've come to realize is that there are many on the left, some in academia, but also people who are actually you know, on the ground 
who aren't actually playing to win. And that's, I think, a very dangerous thing because it gets to be very comfortable because one can simply say, well, here are the problems. And it becomes just a litany of being able to describe a problem. And that's where failing forward comes into play because you see, I do have a deep theoretical understanding and I, I study movements, I study history, uh, uh, but not so that I can become a good movement trivial pursuit player. I study because I want to win and I try to learn from their mistakes so that I can make my own mistakes because we're all going to make mistakes, which is again, the failing forward. And that's the secret of praxis, right? You have to have a theoretical understanding that then allows you to develop a plan that you then try to put into place. And here's the kicker, you have to constantly be willing to reevaluate both your theory and your practice. That's the sweet spot of praxis. And failing forward means that we're expecting that we're not going to ever get it right, that we are continuing on that process. And I'll give you a like a very vulnerable example. When I helped to co-found Cooperation Humboldt, I had this idea, my theory was, okay, I'm gonna bring together uh, like almost a cadre core group of folks, but we'll build a mass movement organization around the cadre. And that, uh, you know, and that as we built the mass movement out, we'll both, we'll broaden the cadre, but also deepen the cadre. So I was trying to, for those of you who are familiar with this language, do a hybrid model of both cadre organizing and mass movement organizing. And the reality is it didn't work. It got too confusing. Uh, and so I actually, and others that were part of that experiment failed forward and said, well, then we're, Cooperation Humboldt is just gonna be a mass movement organization and we're gonna embrace that. And there can be other sectors or other uh, uh, circles in our sociocratic process uh, where folks who are more interested in the theoretical study of revolutionary process can take place. So I hope that sort of answered the question uh, and gave you a very concrete example. Like when I started and co-founded this organization, I had one idea and like the data <laughs> showed me something else. So I lit we collectively literally changed our thinking based on what we were experiencing. Yeah, such a basic kind of fundamental concept of any kind of, whether you want to talk about science or, I mean, frankly, learning to play a sport or whatever, you know, the ability to sum up negative and positive experiences. But, it, but, it, but I mean, as soon as you ask the question, how many left groups actually actively integrate that into their own approach to things? I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I feel like it's not as it's not as uh, hard, you know, hardwired into our kind of common sense as, as it should be, or softwired perhaps, uh, since it should be malleable. Uh, and Nicola, how does, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want to take the fail forward language itself. I'm not trying to impose that on you. Uh, I think it's a useful concept uh, and I appreciate David's elaboration, but you know, how has this looked like from the academic side? And I'm not, obviously you've never been just on that side. Um, you know, I think I speak, I think I can identify with some of the work you're doing as a labor organizer, e even in and outside of academia. Um, so how is, you know, how is, what have been some of the struggles and, you know, uh, what's the role that academia has played and sometimes maybe fragmenting some of these movements and, and how can we do better and how maybe are you doing better as a result of this uh, conference project? Well, you know, this question really just brings up a lot for me. You know, in terms of failing forward, I actually really resonate with that. So I kind of wanted to just address it that, you know, I received my master's in an interdisciplinary program that focus on ecology and political science and sociology and kind of brought these different disciplines together. So I am not really a kind of siloed thinker, <laughs> though in academia, a lot of times uh, we do certainly kind of feel like, well, I'm just in biology and I'm just in chemistry and people don't really have conversations with one another and certainly across biology to the social sciences or sciences to social sciences. Uh, so I always find that really interesting. But, you know, in failing forward, I mean, I I'm also an artist. I like to create and I always laugh about when I make something that I'm like, well, this is just garbage. But then it's also funny because, you know, that's all also a time of just creation and learning. And I always try to encourage folks to just, whether they're in the classroom or, you know, even if I'm doing self-talk with myself and I'm in the studio playing with clay, you know, or something like that, it's just kind of like, how do you continue to grow and learn and evolve your thinking uh, so that we do get stronger and better? That's part of the coaching 
that I end up doing a lot of times in labor organizing with my colleagues is that a lot of times, uh, especially in academia, people are so afraid of not having the right answer because we stand up in the classroom all the time and we say, look at me, I'm, you know, I have this information. Let me share it with you. This is my job to know what's going on. And so for uh, faculty, a lot of times they're really nervous because they're not trained in organizing and they a lot of times don't come from backgrounds where they've had to kind of connect with one another in this kind of way uh, and so i tend to find that that's my my hardest uh, place to move people is when they're really nervous about not getting it right. And for someone who's, you know, been in a political, uh, you know, my first job out of college was organizing uh, for the Arizona Democratic Party in Flagstaff, Arizona in the 2010 midterm elections. We lost horribly in 2010. It was like a horrible year for Democrats, you know, and so it's just kind of thinking about any time that you've had these challenges or, you know, times that things have haven't worked out or like the heartbreak that I went through after being arrested at Standing Rock and coming back to Humble and not having, you know, seen the change that I had committed myself to going out there and standing in support of, you know, the heartbreaks that you experience in organizing, I think is really those learning moments that help you to kind of do the organizing long term because it's is challenging and it's not like you're just going to get a gold star like david's been talking about like you're just going to knock out a home run first go there's going to be a lot of real like self-reflective learning that you need to do and so i'm always just trying to call it call in my colleagues to say look you know we may not get this right we might piss some people off it may not be perfect but it's so important that you stand here with me now that you take this position because this is what's going to protect someone's job you know protect our community take a stand against corporatized america that's infusing its way into our education spaces. This is something that I see as a short-term fight, but also a long-term fight. It's something that is necessary. And so trying to get people involved, um, you know, I, I do struggle with that uh, in terms of faculty labor, but that's part of, you know, my continual work. How do we get people involved, you know, recognizing themselves as actual workers? And so like, oh, I'm a fancy faculty member and it, at a, you know, at a college is like, you're a worker, you know, and you have to recognize like stripping away this kind of like little space of privilege that you've been, you know, comfortable with for a moment that that's being chipped away very quickly. And so in recognizing solidarity with your colleagues, with movements outside of your campus, with your community, that's really where I think that the the work needs to happen and that's where I try to do things as an organizer. Yeah, I mean one thing I'm I'm picking up from both of you here is you know the this uh this emphasis on you know the need for due praxis and summing up and taking risks and summing up negative and positive lessons but also along with that you know that willingness to experiment that willingness to be self-critical reflective is also the, the importance of building a culture uh, in a tone of trust, right? That that enables people to to be to feel like they they can make mistakes, that they don't have to put on this show of perfection, premature perfection, which is just kind of absurd on its face if you really think about it. And I think academia is a tr is I mean, as you flag Nicola, like a really tricky can be a challenging place to do that, right? Uh, even even adjunct professors, right, who are who are paid less than you know full time fast food workers. You know, per hour might, might still have you know be kind of very feel like they're carrying the aura of the institution and not want to tell their students right. Let their students in the other side of the you know of the the uh, of the stage here, right? The other side of of the uh, of the curtain, right? And let them know you know I'm mixing metaphors, you know, but how the sausage is made or whatever, right? You know, we, you know, which actually maybe. Well, like, I think that like we feel bad about it, not to like jump in on you there, Joe. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, we feel it's when we start talking about like really like when I first got hired at HSU as a lecturer, and I was also working at uh, our local community college, College of the Redwoods. So I was like piecing together jobs as many adjunct or lecturer faculty do. And it's a little bit embarrassing to kind of feel like, okay, you've got this job, you're in the door, you might be sharing an office with two other people, but you're there. You're not really sure if you're a full faculty member, but you're there. And then you're recognizing like, oh my gosh, like in terms of the financial compensation for this work, 
yeah, you know, it's, it's appalling. And it also, I think we kind of internalize like that guilt or that sort of like pain that we feel is like the institution. A lot of times, you know, we have to think about how we like internalize like the actual implications of an exploitive system. And we think about, oh, you know, if I only worked harder, if I only took on more work, if I was only, you know, doing this extra piece or this extra piece to make myself a more valuable worker, then perhaps I would be rewarded for it. This is the training that has been indoctrinated into our manner of thinking. And that's the kind of ideological shift that's necessary to kind of move from this is a normalized, like I'm supposed to be stressed out. I'm supposed to be fearful of losing my job. That's a normal part of being an American citizen to like, what does it actually look like to socially invest in one another and have a socially responsible uh, kind of priority as opposed to something that's just about financial gains? Yeah, it's so true. So, so uh, you know, terrifically put, um, you know, I mean, I just finished David Graeber's uh, book. I don't know if you all have read it, Bullshit Jobs, A Theory, I, you know, uh, really highly recommend it. Um, and that's my give green light. If anybody feels the need to swear in the rest of this program, you know, we welcome it here. I, I mean, I feel like great David Graeber would probably be someone who you'd want, you know, would have been in the thick of your conference, you know, if he was still with us, a tragic loss, um, but he left us so much anyway. But I mean, he, you know, he cites a variety of studies and a lot of qualitative research on, you know, basically close to, depending on the poll you look at, like 40% of people in developed countries, when privately, of course, you know, uh, are asked if they feel that the, the work they do has any meaning and is making the world a better place, say no. I mean, this is different than the academic, which hopefully feels like they are doing something useful, even if they're not getting paid enough for it as an adjunct. But I feel like you just point to something really powerful, which is like the flip side of David's, like the need to overgrow, as I understand that concept. It's like that also requires that we have growth to do. You know, like, like the system has marked us. You know, it's not to just get into like a navel gazing, you know, only individualist approach to spiritual solutions, but to like, like we need structural change, but that we are a part of that, right? Our culture, our way of communicating, our way of narrating our lives, right, and relating to others is a part of that structural change. And, I, and this isn't so much a question, I just really appreciate what you both are saying. And I'm going to pitch it back to Rachel for the next question. But I mean, just thank you for, for elaborating it, because I do think, uh, you know, we need spaces to model this and practice this, you know, uh, in safer spaces in some ways, so that we can bring it back to, you know, the challenging communities and workplaces we, we live, we live in, or try to. Um, Rachel? So you both have spoken about the importance of getting directly involved um, and also sort of rebuilding relationships with other people and seeing it starting to view other people like as human beings and not just through the lens of like what they can provide for us through capitalism. Um, so, and one thing that sort of makes the solidarity economy approach so unique and so accessible is that people can sort of engage with it at all different levels, right? Like people can just adjust the consuming that they're already doing and people can also go out and organize a workplace. It really um, gives all those opportunities for people to put whatever they can into it. So I just wanna ask you right now, um, what are some different ways that all of us can start to invest in our communities um, and participate in an economy that is a little bit more equitable and a little bit more just? You just, all right, so Nicola just pointed at me. So uh, uh, thank you for the question again, Rachel. So uh, the way I think about it is this, remember that the word economy uh, just comes from the Attic Greek, right? And it literally means the management of the household or the management of home. And I think about home as not just Jarajiji, otherwise known as Eureka, where the, the, the city in which I live, but it's literally, I am on a watershed. And the reality is that we've actually done a terrible job of managing uh, the ecosystem and managing our home. We've also done a terrible job of really taking care of each other. You know, there's a, a great uh, uh, line that says, we're all just trying to walk each other home. And it almost like I tear up even just saying that out loud because I know what that means because we're supposed to be taking care of each other. And we've done a terrible job of taking care of ourselves and of taking care of each other. 
And it reminds me, Rachel, that, uh, you know, uh, 13 months ago when the pandemic first hit, uh, I, like, frankly, government was completely incapable, uh, like, uh, at least locally here in Humboldt County. And uh, honestly, Cooperation Humboldt literally ginned up from scratch a mutual aid network. Uh, we began to literally make hand sanitizer. Uh, we made cloth masks. We literally created a system for which people could say, I'm self-quarantining, I can't get groceries. So we actually had a whole system where we were running errands for each other. Uh, we were providing uh, those the, you know, sanitary masks. Uh, I, I deepened the relationship that I had with the Weot tribe because we just reached out to them and said, we know y'all are out there on Table Bluff at the reservation, like how can we help? And literally we began uh, a mutual aid network that then brought together folks who were working with the houseless community and the immigrant rights community, uh, a whole host of communities. And literally we built, frankly, a dual power structure, right? Because we were literally acting like government at the moment. And Rachel, out of that experience, Cooperation Humboldt then built a, uh, a disaster response and community resilience program area that continues to this day, so that when the recent fires happened here in Northern California and our community was inundated by uh, refu fire refugees, otherwise known as climate refugees, uh, we were, along with the American Red Cross, Cooperation Humboldt, uh, a community organizing group in the American Red Cross became the go-to people uh, that our local government was actually looking to and the, the disaster response professionals were literally leaning on us for that part of it, right? And just to name it, now we have at the Solidarity, Con uh, at the Post-Capitalism Conference, you, we have a session called Disaster Response Through Community Resilience and it's being hosted by nationally folks from Transition US and members of the Cooperation Humboldt core team who came up as independent volunteers and are now actually on staff and coordinate the entire disaster response and community resilience team. So like that's just to begin to scratch the surface of the question that you asked. One thing that I wanted to contribute to that as well is that, you know, when you're asked like how can people kind of plug in and get ready to participate in this sort of way in their own communities i'm i'm kind of thinking like you know we aren't really asking that people reinvent the wheel and that's why the conference is so valuable because it really is a, a opportunity for people to see as david was mentioning earlier in this show those practical solutions that are already happening the networks that are already building the work that is already occurring that people just may not know about and so it can feel really overwhelming sometimes to think how do i participate okay so i go i'm gonna go to this conference and then i'm gonna you know change my whole community into you know based off of these core principles of a solidarity economy you know whoa i'm not ready for that and it's kind of like like, no, like the heavy lifting is already happening and having more people on board together lightens the load, you know, like we help to lift it all up together. And that's really what the conference does. I mean, Humble is a really interesting place and has a lot to teach uh, and share with the world. I did my uh, master's research in Southern Humble and really looked at the kind of evolution of community involvement, activism and organizing that had occurred since the 1970s there. And I think that that's why we're really inviting people to come in and see what's been going on because um, while humble sort of if anyone's ever traveled up there you know it takes a while to get to humble you know if you're dry if you fly into san francisco you're gonna be on the road for at least six hours to get up to humble you know it's it takes us uh, a while to get anywhere you know we have crazy roads that a lot of times get washed out in the winter and there's difficulties of getting out you know it's very remote but that's what's really trained humble folks up on resilience the kind of work that david is talking about is really just foundational kind of work that's necessary in any community. But it's just incredible that this kind of uh, work has this legacy and has a lot of different tendrils to it that all come together when needs, uh, when there is a need. And so I really uh, always kind of think about like these kinds of legacies of change, uh, these creative projects that have occurred and how they can be really replicated as you know we wait for things 
you know, with climate change, with a lot of these catastrophes that we're facing, I mean, the dams are going to fail. And when they do, what's going to be in place? When we build a solidarity economy, when we understand at least the blueprint of what it could potentially look like, it prepares us to imagine, to construct, and to participate in the ways that will save each other. So one thing that I'm hearing a lot of um, in this conversation is that um, movements tend to be more successful and build to bigger, more fundamental change when we sort of connect them, but also just expose how we're already connected in ways that are often like hidden from us. Like we do not see the labor and we sort of are connected in these ways, but really directly communicating from people for making that explicit. Um, so how can we expand this even further to people who we are most detached from? Like how can we involve people who um, their labor might be totally invisible to us, like people in different communities, people in the global south. Um, how can we expand uh, our network of communities and like appreciation of each other's labor even further? Yeah, well, I think like uh, the kind of like basics of organizing kind of come into that of just like recognizing and looking out for who's doing work and who can you connect with. And so that a lot of times just is relationship building. It's just basic 101 stuff. But relationship building is also really important because that helps us to understand what struggles people are going through. Like, yeah, your working conditions may be different than mine. When I talk to folks with our Central Labor Council in uh, Humble and Del Norte County, you know, it's interesting because we're talking with folks that are nurses, that work for grocery stores, that are in cannabis, that work in a variety of different industries, um, are teachers in other types of institutions, you know, and from understanding the struggles that people are facing that allows us to connect with each other and figure out what do you really need? It doesn't make sense for me to say, hey, like this is what's been happening at Humble. Y'all should just do this right here and now. It takes, you know, these are the pieces that are working in one particular context. And then like, what are you needing or what are you looking for and what's going to best serve your community? I mean, we have to kind of go to sometimes like those basics of, um, of learning in spaces that maybe we're not as familiar with. I always try to encourage people, you know, just like when you're kind of like a child in a new look in a new space, you're learning a language or you're learning different customs and you know what's polite and not polite. You kind of have to watch and you have to observe and you have to be a little bit quiet sometimes. And as you are acquiring those skills and making your connections and building your relationships, then you get to a space where maybe it's a little bit, you know, you can speak more freely, you can share your ideas and you can start to build. And that's kind of just like a basic of how I think that we should be thinking about interacting with space in spaces that are not our own, but then also just kind of listening and learning as David's been saying, how, you know, talking to the Wiat tribe, what are the issues that y'all are facing when we're going through COVID? I mean, the struggles in even a small community can be different for different community members. And so I think it's important to kind of pay attention to those little dynamics. Yeah, great. I mean, these are just great thoughts. So much on on the table here. Um, I really think that that you know Rachel's question about the internationalist dimension of this, you know, the invisibility of kind of the way in which imperialist capitalism, as I understand it, you know, or the you know kind of veils the labor of the global south, right? Even even our best intentions can come, you know, can come up uh, short, right? When we don't, you know, when when we're limited by the national borders, we're operate that we are taught and not as taught intellectually. But you know uh, that we're structurally kind of compelled to at least start from. So I mean, my my question is about is about like the U.S. state uh, itself, uh, and uh, the you know, but also the, the the state and local municipal state government. I mean, um, how do you y'all conceive? I mean, I guess conceptually, but also practically, what's been your experience uh, engaging solidarity economy projects around this conference or beyond, um, in terms of the relationship to the existing government structures. I mean, I understand the kind of overthrow, overgrow point, but I'd like to wonder if you could concretize that a little bit, you know, theorize it a little more for us, uh, for this audience, but then also uh, 
you know, to maybe give us an example of, of how the, the, the different dimensions or possibilities of working within the existing structures, as well as parallel to them, kind of play out in your experience? So I'll take that one uh, first, uh, because, you know, it's funny, I, I sort of chuckle because, you know, I'm a lawyer by training, I've sued corporate polluters, I've lobbied elected officials, I've run for office myself, I ran for attorney general on the Green Party ticket in Texas, pledging to use that office to revoke the charters of corporations that routinely violate safety, health, environmental protection, and worker protection laws. I ran for president of the United States on the Green Party ticket. So I absolutely believe in engaging in electoral politics, both at the national level and at the local level. Also worth pointing out, Rachel, uh, that the Green Party uh, is a global party. There are Greens uh, uh, organizing in every continent except for uh, Antarctica uh, and in uh, the rest of the world where there is proportional representation an infinitely more democratic uh, voting system. You have Greens actually serving uh, in minority coalitions in government, uh, serving in the national assemblies uh, all across the world. And as I tell my anarchist uh, friends, you may not believe in the state, but the state believes in you. Uh, and that's why for me, uh, I engage in electoral politics, but y'all, I am no electoral fetishist because so many people I meet seem to fall back into that either or paradigm that Joe was sort of referencing early, earlier, right? Either they say elections are for chumps. If elections could change anything, they'd make it illegal. Movements are where it's at. We just have to build movements, right? Elections are ridiculous. Or they say elections are where, are, are where the actual policies are getting made. That, that's where uh, the, the actual enact, you codify any changes that we're able to make. Movements might change minds, but you know, the movement actually changed the mind uh, around nuclear weapons. And yet nuclear weapons are still stockpiled because we didn't elect people to actually dismantle nuclear weapons. So elections are where it's at. And of course, they're both right, meaning they're both wrong, uh, which is to say it's not either or, it has to be both and, which is why in the solidarity economy framework, we know that the state, whether at the local, county, state, or even national level, can either make those non-reformist reforms easier, they can facilitate them, or they can make it almost impossible to do. But even if they, I said almost impossible, because even in the most repressive situation, one can still engage in acts of solidarity. In fact, the movement and world history is replete with examples of that. So the way I think about that question is not the state, yes or no, but how do I relate to the state? And elections for me is just one more front of struggle. It's not the only one, it's not the end all be all, but you damn right I'm going to engage uh, in elections because I'm gonna use every tool in the toolbox I have to be able to try to interrupt the, the base narrative. And honestly, y'all, like um, my, my quick read is like the neoliberal center is not going to hold. It's either gonna be some version of eco-socialism or some version of fascism. Uh, and uh, so for liberals and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, that sometimes annoy me to be honest, uh, but I also know I have to win them over. I have to work with them because ultimately they're going to have to either break to the radical left or they're going to break fascist. I really believe that. And so I try to keep that in mind that everybody is in a process. And, you know, I used to say I only have one enemy and that's the class enemy. Now I realize I actually sadly have two enemies, my class enemy and I have members of my own class who have literally decided because of white supremacy nationalism, what have you, have decided, even though they're, they're members of the working class, are literally going to break with the fascist when the time comes. So I have two categories of enemies, but I'm trying very hard to bring as many people and convince them to come our way because we're more fun. I'm glad you said that, David, because I think that when we're looking at like that was kind of the point that I was trying to make a little bit earlier as well as that, you know, when we're talking about uh, the politics that are happening within any particular movement, you can't keep all the other stuff at the sidelines like, no, hang on. We're just talking about labor. OK, hang on to like the sexism, the racism, you know, like let's like keep all that stuff over here and we're just going to focus on this. That's part of the sort of 
necessary work of getting to know what people are going through and how that may impact their ability to organize and get you moving in the direction that you want to be moving in. You know, uh, I, so I just wanted to tack that on, but I thought that was brill brilliantly said. Now, this is great stuff. I mean, I think the point you made, David, about and Nicola as well, building it, building on it in different ways, um, you know, that everyone's involved in a process. You know, I mean, that, that you know, that, that, I mean, I think there's a danger, there's a long history in the United States, partly because people have given up on winning, whether even though they might talk big sometimes, you know, the, the, there's a way in which strategic political differences can be turned into kind of morality. You know, right? Like more, you know, as if we're going to burn our bridges forever because of this conflict we have, as opposed to realizing, you know, we might need each other down the road, right? You know, even if we do have a serious difference now, let's not like, if, if we can avoid it, let's not burn the bridges, right? Because we really do need the vast majority if we don't want a, a revolutionary transformation to be an utter bloodbath. I mean, you know, let, let alone just impossible altogether, right? I mean, you really, so, I mean, I just, again, just really echoing and affirming so much of what y'all are putting down here. Um, I think um, we're gonna take maybe, I think Rachel has one more question for you and then, but before she asks, cause I wanna just signal to our audience that we are now at the hour mark, just a couple minutes over actually, we started a little after seven today, unusual for us, but we did. Um, and so we'd love to welcome your questions or comments. I know we have a number of, we have some Shelter and Solidarity producers who have questions. I know we have Victor Wallace, a uh, very profound uh, theorist um, and uh, writer on issues of eco-socialism and social movement and the left. Uh, I would love to get you involved, Victor, if you're there um, with a question and we'll open it up in just a minute, but first we'll give Rachel one more to you, you both and then uh, we'll, we'll make this collective. So as we close up with our questions, I just want to return back to the conference um, and its name, the post-capitalism. And there's something about that name in the post that sort of um, implies that there's hope, right, for a world after this, which is something that I think a lot of us aren't used to letting ourselves feel hope for. So I just want to ask you, like, what gives you hope that there is a better future um, and that we can get there? I'll jump in first, uh, Rachel, because uh, especially for uh, you know listeners and viewers of Shelter and Solidarity, probably the thing that's giving me the most hope right now is uh, our study groups. Uh, and I know that as somebody, because we're so action oriented here, uh, it might strike people as odd that I would say it's our study groups that gives me the most hope. But that's because I know that there's never been a revolution where there were not actually revolutionaries who actually were willing to study process, to study what is happening. Uh, not everybody is going to be a theorist, but we also need theorists. And you know, Rachel, uh, two, three years ago, uh, I would have to literally put in, you know, four, six weeks of solid organizing just to convince a dozen people to, to participate with me in a study group to to, to read something and to talk about it. Part of that is driven by my own knowledge that I, I hone my analysis by engaging in, in, in discourse with people and that like conversations like this just help me be a better thinker and a better organizer, right? But also because I knew that my experience was you build social solidarity in those contexts and you, and you build a shared analysis. And so I knew how valuable uh, study groups are. And now, Rachel, Cooperation Humboldt has run 21 study groups. Uh, the last session when we opened it, uh, and we always cap it at 12 to 15, when we opened it, we didn't run one study group. We didn't run two study groups. We had three study groups running concurrently because we were overwhelmed by people who wanted to roll with us. And I think it's partly because we are clear and unequivocal that in our study group, we're going to grapple with the intersectionality of white supremacy, settler colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and capitalism to prepare us to actually dismantle those systems and create new social, political, and economic institutions. We just opened up another study group. In 48 hours, we had 10 people sign up for it. That's what gives me hope. People are hungry to participate in something that makes sense. You know, if I think about hope, it's like my mind goes to so many different times, but I think that, you know, to be in a place where people are allowing them 
ourselves to imagine and dream of something better. Um, when I've seen that happen, you know, being in a real like collaborative, like collective space of like protest or organizing, you know, or even in <laughs> as oppressive sometimes as the institutions can be in academia, like that's where I started learning how to imagine something different and then fight for it articulate it you know i was a debater in college and so i spent four years really just talking a lot competitively about how fucked up the world was and how i wanted to change it and then when it you know then i started getting involved with my community and that was when i started working on indigenous projects um in northern Arizona and really learning about different ways of living and being and conceptualizing the world. You know, I lived in Thailand for a couple of years and that kind of opened my mind up also to different ways of living, being and conceptualizing the world. And there was uh, an understanding in a lot of those types of spaces that we don't have the right answer and that's okay. And so I think that from continuously putting myself in different places where, gosh, it's been heart wrenching to not win in particular spaces, to know that someone doesn't care at all about how their congressional office is going to serve indigenous peoples in Northern Arizona, or how, you know, a pipeline is going to be destructive to an entire community of people and then everyone else downstream, you know, and to think about how all these, you know, times where we're up against this power uh, can be so, uh, you know, it's, it's depressing to say the least. Um, it's, but it's also hopeful because you see people who have been fighting fights longer than you have and and being resilient in the face of some of the worst atrocities that we can imagine. And when you see that in different spaces or pockets around this earth, I think that that foundationally has moved me. So I just don't accept business as usual. And when I have folks that kind of think that it's idealistic to be moving towards change, I just know in my core that I have a belief in something different and better. And no matter how much I think that my life would be a lot easier and more simple if I could just, you know, like not care and hope and believe in a better future. It's like there's something messed up in my body that I just can't let it go. And so it's like I'm just going to keep fighting for this future because I believe that it is the best, absolute best use of my time. Um, I believe that that's what I owe to the people that I love. It's like, what is the most damage I can do to this system that is destroying the earth and the people that I love in my community? Um, I'm going to try to change it, you know? And it's just like, that's, I don't know. It's like a light that I can't turn it out. <laughs> that's where the hope comes from. I really appreciate you bringing up um, intergenerational relationships and organizing as really like a great source of hope and strength for both sides of the equation. Um, and I just wanted to thank you both so much. I'm really excited to hear how you respond to our audience's questions. So I'm going to kick it over to Joe now to get started on that portion. Terrific. Let's let's get collective with this uh, solidarity sharing and thinking together. Uh, I see that we have three folks who have indicated they like to ask a question. I, I have one too, but I'll hold it back for now. Uh, but let's not forget, I do want to come back to the art, the role of art and culture in this. I mean, I think the comments that I just heard about hope in a hopeless time, you know, uh, raises that question we can maybe come back to later. But first, we have uh, Mark has a question, possibly two. Uh, and then I have one I'm going to relay from our co-producer, our, our stalwart uh, organizer of, uh, you know, with the 12 armed handed, the 12 handed organizer of Seren Mudliar who's not with us tonight here due to another commitment, but he uh, he left a number of questions. I'm gonna to try to relay one. And uh, Linda Liu, another producer of the show has a question as well. So let's go to Mark. Mark, you have one or take two if you'd like. And then if anyone else would like, we'll take them together to get as many voices out here and then we'll we'll pitch it back to our great our great pair of guests. Mark? Well, you, you get so many things sort of moving and thinking and I, I'll try to take two and turn them into one but you've got you know lots of ferment and, and I'm, I'm still struggling with some of this um, as David explained sort of the solidarity economy it's 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 very inspiring right um, 
and and it sounds a lot to me like Henri Lefebvre's Right to the City, right? And and um, that sort of embrace of diversity, the meeting needs through non-market exchange, the the democratic control of production and resources, and it makes me wonder if you, if building on sort of Rachel's questions, does the solidarity do as the sol as an organizer in, in solidarity economy organizations, do you have any interaction with some of the global south right to the city folks because there does seem to be some commonality with the right to the city movements um and so that's part of one question but on the moving forward off of that there does seem to be a difference between some of the right to the city and the solidarity economy as you've explained it this evening and that's in part the right to the city has a very definite revolutionary core um, the citizens of Seattle should make the corporate decisions for Boeing, right? You know, I mean, there's, it's very plain uh, that, you know, the, the workers of the city should control the production of that city. And when it's very inspiring to sort of hear about Humboldt substituting for the state by creating masks and creating hand sanitizer, but in a certain respect, that removes responsibility from the state um, it, re, you know, it release it, it lessens our demand on the state. How does that move forward to sort of a revolutionary reclamation of the value that corporations steal from us, that it really see, feels like the state is the only tool that's going to get to to that sort of redistribution. Um, and I sometimes feel like mutual aid just means that the state can cut corporate taxes again, right? Because um, we're solving the problems that we would call on them to do, um, and and I don't mean that as a slam. It's just it's the quandary that I'm that I'm torn by by the the rhetoric here. Um, and I hope that question makes sense. It, well, it does to me, Mark, and I'm glad you asked it because it also gives me a chance to call back to that failing forward. Uh, you've literally actually uh, uh, basically rearticulated. Remember when I answered, well, I thought that I was going to build a cadre organization and then a mass movement uh, around it to bring people in. It actually came out of, uh, I wouldn't call it exactly the right to the city formulation, but I was clearly, uh, for me and the, the core folks, we clearly thought of ourselves like having been inspired by Zapatismo, by being inspired by the idea of actually uh, governing, right? and. Uh, I do, I am a revolutionary. I do want to restructure the entire system. And I, I believe that we are going to have to take the state. Uh, so, so I came out of that framework. What I realized is that, that bluntly, the, like the growth that Cooperation Humboldt was experiencing, I couldn't integrate that fast enough. And so I leaned, or I, I followed where the motion was taking us to say, all right, well, we're going to actually do uh, do this other thing uh, as an experiment. So I guess what I'm getting at is, I absolutely agree that we have to engage the state directly and ultimately we have to take control of the state. Uh, I often say again that, you know, you can't ignore the state because if you do, it'll pounce, right? It'll get you. Uh, and clearly as you ac accurately uh, observed currently, there's been a more merger between the transnational corporation and the state itself. And that reflects even at the local level. By the way, that's what uh, Mussolini called fascism, right? Uh, that merger. Uh, so, so that's absolutely happening. And I haven't found enough people in Humboldt County who even have an understanding of what anarcho-communism is or what Zapatismo is, or who could even have an appreciation for the right to the city uh, approach or, or alignment, uh, you know, so we don't have a Miami worker center here, right? Uh, so this is an example of us trying to build where we are uh, and you take people where they are and build together. So that's how I'm kind of thinking about what you're saying. And again, I didn't, I heard it not as like, not as a gotcha. I heard it as a legitimate question and a really hard challenge. And I'm owning, I don't think I actually know the answer this is an example of where we're trying to fail forward and just figure it out as we go. I, I, and if I had a more like pat answer for you, I promise I would share it. I'm still looking for it. 
Yes, and thank you for taking it in the spirit it was intended. It's certainly not a gotcha question. It's a struggle um, entirely of of how do we move from where we are to where we want to go. Um, thank you for not thinking of it as a, you know, that I got you on your theoretical period. You didn't cross your T on, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, you're bringing up something really important, Mark, because there's always, uh, there's a lot of times, there's often a lot of uh, like contradiction and kind of paradoxes that exist in our grapple with how we move forward, right? And so I was, you know, I was thinking about David's remark earlier where he was talking about how, you know, it can't be just electoral politics and it can't just be movements. And I kind of see it in a sort of similar vain as that of just thinking about of course like we do a lot of things that shore up the inadequacies of our system <laughs> i do that all the time when i overwork myself to show up for my students because i believe that their education is important <laughs> and i know i'm taking the burden of the institution you know and making it so that the cracks are not glaringly exposed. But that's part of the tension, right, of how do we figure out, you know, a release for ourselves of what we're doing to like make sure that people still do get access to the things that are necessary or we believe that are necessary for them and the system is structured as it is to provide these types of resources for folks. But we also know that, you know, our uh, way of volunteerism in this country is an integral part of the way that politics functions as well. So it's kind of like this really interesting balance of, you know, when I talk to my students and I ask them similar questions, you know, I ask them, where do you go if you want to escape the state? <laughs> and then I also ask them, how do you engage in politics? You know, we talk a lot about electoral politics in my classes, and I always ask them, you know, what do you see your community, or, you know, or your friends, like, what do you see people doing in politics today? Because from my mom, you know, we talk a lot about the election, and she's always really disheartened, like, why aren't people going out to vote? And I'm kind of saying the conversations that I'm having with students in California about how they're participating in politics is a lot of times recognizing that they're not being represented in the way that they would like to be seen. Uh, in electoral politics. They're not seeing the types of issues like I've heard David say this before, you know, and I'm in the same boat, like my political ideology does not fit on any ballot that I've ever seen, you know, only in my dreams. And so I kind of think that we are in this interesting space of of course, you know, we the slow change of within our system to challenge and to put pressure consistently on the state to evolve and change and adopt the types of things that we believe would really have meaningful change in our lived experience is fundamental. And then at the other you know, side of that, like recognizing that, yeah, you know, we're doing our best to take care of ourselves, <laughs> take care of our communities. And there's going to be some stuff there that we're like, shoot, I know I shouldn't be putting in those extra hours or I no, I shouldn't be masking these inadequacies by providing basic care and consideration for folks when I know it should be coming from somewhere else. And I'm pissed off that I have to, but I'm still going to do it <laughs> because I know that there's a need there. And then I'm also going to be getting upset when I'm lobbying politicians and, you know, speaking out and constructing my classes to be thinking about how do we actually make changes so that we don't have to always carry these burdens. Great question, Mark. And I think it deserved to be addressed directly rather than to sit in a in a queue for for for, for five to ten minutes because it is, I think, it's a really comradely, uh, productive but challenging question. And I think, you know, we're we're all trying to make, I mean, many of us anyway, to make transformative change in imperfect conditions, right? We have to make choices with the resources we have and the strategies and tactics that are available and learning as we go. Uh, let's let's bring in, uh, I'd like to actually bring in one live speaker. Brian Gibbons likes to ask a question. I think I'm going to preface it with the question that Seren is not here to ask himself right now. Um, he asked a number, but this was one I think hasn't been addressed directly. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll go to Brian and then Linda, maybe we can get these three together and then give them back to you all together. So um, Seren asked, and I think you got this over email before, before we met today. Um, why post-capitalist, you know, uh, which is in the sense of like, why no name 
for what comes after, or right, or, or right, what um, you know. The, of course, there is. We're having a resurgence of democratic socialism, or at least the language of democratic socialism. You know, um, how do you? Um, and I'm not reading Seren's question here, but I'm kind of you know offering the spirit of it. Um, you know, how do you? Uh, why no name for the post? You know, what is the, 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 the you know what is the the strategy in kind of leaving the the post capitalist society. Uh, kind of name, you know, kind of to some degree nameless, or do you have a name for that? Or I mean, is maybe solidarity economy is the answer to that? I don't know. So, so the question of, of, of what, what, what is the, you know, what is the name for, or the concept of the post that, that comes after capitalism? Uh, and then I think Brian wanted to ask something that, that might connect with that. And then we'll go to Linda. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll thanks. go really quickly. The, the post was a function of the fact that uh, and Rachel, you picked up on this uh, astutely uh, earlier, right? Which is to say, there is something beyond capitalism. Uh, we have been trained to believe that capitalism is like from on high, it's unassailable. So the whole notion of this being post capitalist is to say, no, there is a system that's going to come next. And by the way, there is going to be a system that comes next. Capitalism is ending under its own terms, but there's nothing to celebrate about that because the, the, the reality is that capitalism, because it's premised upon uh, wage labor and the, uh, extracting the surplus value of labor with automation, robotics, technology, and so forth, literally capitalism as it's been practiced uh, you know, for the past 75 years, it's literally ending. And if we don't replace it with something that is actually uh, generate or uh, uh, rooted within a solidarity framework or regenerative framework or restorative framework, it's going to be some version of fascism. So post-capitalism to anchor that capitalism is ending and something is coming next. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Uh, let's, Brian can, can, can build from that and then we'll bring in Linda and then we'll go back to the, to the guests. Yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, the evening. <clears throat> I particularly like the idea of working on every front that you possibly can to move forward. Yeah, <laughs> you really need to. Um, and, and I've done that. One of the questions that came up as I was listening, though, is that we live in a, in a nation, at least, that's premised on the individual, at least go back to our historic documents and stuff. And then we also have, to the best of my knowledge, you know, we're kind of premised on the Abrahamic religions, you know, you know, of, Christianity uh, and whatever in the se sense of there's always, you know, there's a perception that everything's linear and it's always moving forward and it's always moving up and that sort of thing. And it seems that if those are kind of the guiding principles of, of daily life and that sort of thing, I'm going to achieve something in heaven that our kids are always going to be doing better, you know, and that sort of thing, you know, doesn't also there need to be a philosophical change? Maybe this is a future show, a philosophical change in how people look at the world. You know, you know, and I raise that question as being, you know, um, race a Catholic, still a Catholic, and that sort of thing, understanding that it was a pretty easy road to communism, actually. <laughs> you know, and I was a good altar boy, too. But it seems that we need to be able to do um, uh, change basically the framework on how people are thinking. And that's really a long haul question. Is this the appropriate place for that question? I think it's a great place for it, Brian. And I think, uh, I think we have some great folks to, to speak to it. Let's see if we can get Linda's question too, and then we'll, we'll take them back to, uh, to Nicola and, and David. Linda? Okay, so um, I can't help but point out that today is 420 which uh, prior to COVID was a day for people to come together in and around and through cannabis. So, um, you know, this year is of course a little bit different, but um, I see that the post-capitalism conference has a session on creating a cannabis solidarity economy. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about what this means and what a cannabis equity program is. And also, how do you see that in relation to a uh, commercial cannabis market? Really interesting question, building on the philosophical, certainly the worldview uh, outlook change as well. I mean, I, I think a lot could be said about, I, I would say something in favor of cannabis in that respect, um, <laughs> I, even though we're recorded. Uh, David and Nicola, lots to pick from there. Um, what do you think? You go first, Nicola, and then I'll go. 
<laughs> sure. Sounds good. Um, so I, yeah, I really like all this stuff. And I think that, you know, I just wanted to say quickly, Linda, before I go back to philosophical kind of stuff, but uh, yeah, my research was looking at cannabis, capitalism and bioregionalism, which is really connected to a deep ecology type of mindset in Humboldt. And so I really think it's interesting when we look at any kind of industry, I was uh, analyzing how you know, when we have uh, extractive industries and cannabis has certainly in some capacity has posited itself as an extractive industry, um, because, you know, when we're looking at like the kind of the philosophy that goes into how we think about business and how we organize ourselves and think about the earth and people as an input into that process, we replicate the same harms. So that is kind of just an interesting kind of like side note of that, but I just wanted to say that, you know, when we're looking at in Humboldt County, gold, timber, cannabis, you know, any kind of industry that is uh, structured around a particular way of thinking, it's going to replicate the exact same harms on the earth and on the community, on the people. Um, so I wanted to say, talk though, Brian, about your philosophical change and the necessity of that, because I think that when we're looking at these particular, you know, shifts of consciousness and we're trying to figure out, okay, great, we have people that are thinking and they're open to new ways of of proceeding with, uh, you know, change, but it looks like there's something really rooted, you know, that's like in our culture, that's really hard to overcome. I think that um, I see opportunities for that when people experience, you know, it's like cognitive dissonance, or I kind of like to think of it as like a truth bomb moment, where you see that sort of where you see the world functioning in a way that goes counter to everything that is foundational to you and you believe the world to be. I think when we see like those implications of this capitalist system, like actually playing out before our very eyes, like those are the moments that I kind of refer to of like, those are my truth bomb moments. <laughs> those are the times where I kind of think all of, a, all of a sudden I can no longer continue thinking the way that I was before. And, um, you know, it's good for us to be thinking theoretically about, you know, change and how philosophy comes into all those pieces for sure. Um, but I will say that as someone, and Joe was bringing this up before, as someone who isn't just someone who has studied and just been in academia all my life, but also have, you know, lived, worked and traveled around the world. Um, I have had those moments where you know, in social movement spaces, I've witnessed something that I've read about and I've learned about and I really and I debated about it and I thought I had a really good handle on it. Like no one was going to beat me on this particular issue. But then I was watching something take place um, and the the memory that I have in my mind that I've referenced already before was just being at Standing Rock. Um, but just at that space, like for the first three days, I was just weeping involuntarily and i was kind of at first like oh i just have like it's dusty i have dirt in my eyes i can't you know i <laughs> just i was weeping because i was coming into contact with a recognition of everything that i had been learning that i've been studying that i thought i had a handle on and i was seeing something different playing out in my mind and like I knew that the state was screwed up and I knew that corporations were evil and I knew that they were going to destroy the earth and people and I'd read about it and I love the Zapatistas and I was so fired up but to be there standing being a witness to something catastrophic on so many levels I think those are the times where we like we start to feel something shift within us and I think when we see moments of raw emotion of heartache of something that we know should not happen in this earth you know on this planet um you know george floyd today you know just thinking about the stories of the people that we're connected to even remotely to that these cause shifts in our lives and i think that those moments for us uh, can happen on so many different levels but i want to encourage us to you know like get into connection with one another when people have different lived experiences, because that really does help us to have more opportunity to 
challenge perceptions to look at what philosophies are serving us or hindering our growth and to kind of evolve that into you know what's going to be in the future so i i just think that's an important question i think that's something that people talk about a lot is the philosophy behind everything but i i see philosophy being integral to like our post-capitalism conference being integral to the conversation that we're having here today and i think it's foundational to any kind of change that we're like we're not compartmentalizing that that's here with us and it's here with us in these spaces that we're moving through as well but we have to kind of lean into those emotions like lean into the uncomfortability of that and just say hey like you know we're gonna have to grapple with this stuff as well and that's going to be critical for us to be moving you know away from something that won't be fascist and replicating the harms that we want to avoid and uh, i'll i'll try to to justice to the question brian uh because as you were asking it what really jumped into my mind was like it's not just the 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 individualism but there's a level of hyper individualism uh, that has really, it's just destructive. Uh, and it's not only destructive to the planet, but I actually think it's destructive to us uh, and our psyche, our spirit, uh, ourselves, right? Um, and I, I forget who it was who made the observation, but it certainly rings true to me. And that is at, its co at our core, we're really all usually motivated either by fear or love. Uh, and at least for me, I think that that's mostly true. And so I, I work hard to try to put myself in that, that place of love and compassion and kindness and lean into power with as opposed to power over, collaboration as opposed to competition, right? Uh, and th th that kind of approach uh, uh, and really a kind of uh, a, a willingness for radical forgiveness of myself and others and just that I'm doing my best. And I'll actually like go full on uh, philosophy for you or, or my, my own orientation. And that is that I have both a spiritual and political practice that is premised on my understanding of what the goddess expects of me. She does not expect or demand that I win. What she says to me every day is do your best, right? Like, it's not my responsibility to win. It's my responsibility to do my best. And then, and here's the kick, y'all, release the result. I have to actually recognize that I, it's incredibly hubristic to imagine that I can dismantle capitalism or white supremacy or settler colonialism. I can do my best to build authentic, meaningful relationships with people. I can do my best to act in a loving, kind, compassionate way and fierce, fiercely defend the righteous uh, and, like, and, and I just lean into that. So that's how I think about that philosophical uh, piece. And Linda, I'm really grateful that you actually brought up 420, um, you know, because we are here in Humboldt. And for those of you who don't know, Humboldt is famous as the place where the finest cannabis is grown anywhere in the, main, uh, in the mainland uh, US. There's a great history to it. It's also worth pointing out that in Southern Humboldt, uh, where the uh, a kind of both individualism and communalism kind of merged together in this beautiful experiment. Because you see, those back to the land hippies in the 1970s, uh, yeah, they lived communally. Yeah, they made a bunch of money growing pot. And you know what they did? They built KMED Community Radio Station. You know what one of the most uh, famous programs was called the Safety Report? You know what the Safety Report was? Using a FCC licensed community radio station to say, Five trucks have just been spotted going up Fickle Hill. They just plant past uh, mile marker 313. It's been reported and observed twice. That's three, the, like literally the safety report was reporting on the federal government's campaign against marijuana planting. I'm not making this shit up. That's literally what they were doing. And wait, there's more. They built beginnings, which began as a... Uh, a, a preschool uh, a child care facility because out there uh, in the woods, they didn't have a child care facility. Wait, there's more. They built the senior 
the Healy Senior Center to care for their elders. Wait, there's more. They built the Mateel Community Center, like literally out in Southern Humboldt, way out in the sticks. What you saw was basically a kind of solidarity economy where they were coming together because the community had sort of recognized what the needs were and they were basically doing the things that government wasn't doing, right? So that spirit of the best spirit of what came out of Southern Humboldt is what I hope that we're trying to recreate. And the solidarity cannabis economy, and I'm going to really uh, 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 be for real here, if it wasn't for cannabis, Humboldt County would be rural Appalachia, right? I mean, this place has been an extraction zone, first the gold rush and settler colonialism, then the extraction of timber, then the extraction of salmon, they just extract, extract, extract. Cannabis is what made this economy actually something different and special. And with cannabis legalization, y'all, we have to be really clear, Marlboro and Seagram's and all the big, huge corporate farmers are coming in on this. The only way that we are going to survive here in Humboldt County is through a process of appellation, which where we basically say Humboldt cannabis means something, and we're going to define it around small family farms, small uh, producers of a particular variety and band, and Appalachia, uh, Appalachian is a process by which you can literally defend that legally. And so we're going, our job is going to be to actually take cannabis farmers who have been, because it was an illegal industry, have a understandable fear of government and fear of the state and a hyper individualism and help them to collectivize and recognize that we're going to have to actually come together in a cooperative way to actually allow them to survive even within their individual farms. So that's the, what we're trying to get to, Linda, when we're talking about the cannabis solidarity economy. I want to highlight what David just said about the way that the state and policing of rural cannabis farmers forced from communalism, hyper individualism of cannabis. Like that's just such an interesting and foundational type of piece for us to kind of just pin out there because uh, it demonstrates that like the history of this place was bringing people together and resilience and communalism, but through the way that police and efforts occurred, it forced people to individualize so that they were not putting themselves at risk for incarceration. You know, because there was <laughs> vigil, like really uh, aggressive policing efforts that ha happened with Operation Green Sweep and a lot of big like federal operations that came in on mom and pop cannabis grow ops. And so it's really interesting to sort of see these dynamics. And cannabis is a great inroad for analyzing how that takes place. Really interesting. Uh, so much, so much uh, le learning so much here and things I can take away even from this from this pre-conference preview. Um, we're gonna give you a chance to give some more logistical information to folks about how they can plug in to the conference before we wrap up. I wanted to ask you, actually ask our guests, uh, Nicole, Nicola and, and David, if you could take a couple more questions. I know we are technically at our hour and a half mark, but we do allow ourselves to go over uh, when we have a rich program as we do tonight. So it sounds, David, that's okay with you? Nicola, is that okay? We could go a few more minutes. Okay, so I know that um, we, let's take another batch. I know Kira Mudiar, one of our stalwart uh, producers has a question. Also, Victor Wallace has a, a comment and it looks like Michael uh, Huey, ha, uh, Hoey has a, a hand up. I think Rachel also has a, a, a follow-up question too. So let's go to Kira and Victor, uh, Michael and, and Rachel, Kira. Uh Thank you guys so much for speaking today. Um, something that really struck me earlier was talking about having space in the conference for processing and reflecting since so much is happening at this time. I'm wondering, when you talk about needing to reflect within your decision-making processes and, and adjustments to your organizing, how does that inform like the literal organizing now creating generative or decision-making spaces versus like reflective ones? Um, in cooperation, Humboldt, and, and beyond? Very powerful question, Gira. I guess I would answer it this way, that uh, 
we are now at Cooperation Humboldt, uh, th those of us who are the core folk uh, are thinking about ourselves as Cooperation Humboldt 3.0. Uh, there was that first uh, effort, uh, some changes were made, and now we're, we're evolving yet again, in large part based on that reflection uh, and frankly self-critique, like what's working and what's not. And one of the ways is you know, that we are now a sociocratic organization. Not sure if folks are familiar with that phrase, but it's really interesting because it is, you know, uh, it is not hierarchical, but it's also not horizontal, right? So many of us come out of a culture and tradition where we say, oh, hierarchies are oppressive and power over, so horizontalism must be the answer, right? But it, how many of us have been in meetings where there's just, yes, I see your facial expression already, dear, right? You already know what I'm talking about, right? There's just endless debate circling around stuff and oftentimes that we don't even care about, right? We're there at the meeting for this other section, but we have to, yes, exactly, Joseph, uh, Joe Occupy was a, a perfect example of that. Now imagine uh, like uh, death to hierarchy, long live hierarchy. What do I mean by that? I mean, Imagine circles of work that are autonomous circles that are connected to each other, but don't have to be dependent on each other. So at Cooperation Humboldt now, we have program areas and projects. There's the food team, there's the housing team, there's the disaster response and community resilience team, there's the care and wellness team, there's a communication Communications team, there's the education team, and those teams are literally independent and autonomous, yet they are connected because there's one person in each one of those groups that's responsible, almost like a spokes council model, to come to the uh, weekly staff meeting to sort of check in with each other. And what we do is check in to say, okay, here's what's working, here's what's not. And we don't have to get permission, but the food team can say, hey, here's what we did and what we're doing. And folks who are not on the food team can sort of weigh in and give advice, but they don't have agency to say, you food team people can't do it that way. So that's how we're kind of thinking about that kind of reflect, uh, building in uh, both reflection, but also in the organizing it itself, at least how it works at Cooperation Humboldt. Great, uh, Nicola. Do you want to speak directly to that, or should we take a couple? Can we take a couple more? Get our get a few more voices in here, or do you want to respond directly to that? Well, no. You know, I want to hear all the voices, and I guess I would just say that you know this is such a a challenging. Uh, it's such a good question, and I constantly am trying to deal with this on sort of small spaces, and then kind of thinking about how we implement that on a statewide level with the California Faculty Associations. We're going into contract negotiations. You know, it's really important that we kind of think about how we're organizing efficiently. And so, I really loved what David was bringing up. Um, and I could speak a lot more about this, but yeah, let's let's kick it over to some another question, perhaps. Well, he's been name checked a couple times tonight. Victor Wallace is with us. Always a pleasure, a regular on Shelter and Solidarity, and a long long time a leading figure for socialism and democracy. One of our sponsors. If you haven't read his works on some of these issues, read Red Green Revolution and other things. Uh, Victor, uh, I'd love to hear a comment or question yeah. from you. Thank you, Joe, and, and thank you, David, for your kind words also. I've really enjoyed this uh, discussion. And I mean, I, I was reluctant to raise any question because I feel so much just basically in agreement with, with what you're doing. And I was in, interested really in how you're brainstorming about it. And of course, if I start to raise questions, it'll be all kinds of things that are uh, involve a whole additional discussion. But I thought I'd just mention them now just in case to see, see what you'd want to bring up. First of all, when you were talking about the motivation of uh, students, uh, Nicola, especially, I, I'm thinking especially of my experience in the last few years in corresponding with prisoners who I, I find tremendously motivated. The, you know, the ones who, once they begin to take an interest, there's an absolutely uh, unquenchable desire to, to learn more and to, and, and to build. So, so there's, this process is happening there. So naturally, I wonder how that will fit in. A second uh, comment, area of comments, is just in rela relationship to the whole current situation of the pandemic. And I'm, I'm even just wondering as a purely practical question, how you're uh, conducting this, uh, this conference and how you're including others. I, I, I've found the, uh, the, the, the double effect of this that on, on the one hand, obviously it has the, the negative effect of, of distancing ourselves 
in a, in a certain way. And, and even though I conduct classes via Zoom, I'm constantly disappointed by the fact that half of the students keep their cameras turned off. Uh, but, but, the, but the other thing about COVID is, is the, the prospect of a kind of continuation of this situation and, and how uh, one relates to that in the context of, of all the efforts that you're undertaking. Finally, the, the third just general area that comes up naturally, which is again, a huge topic, but it's the, the international dimension of all this. And when we speak of post-capitalism now, the, the question of the, of the challenge posed to the United States by China, especially because China, although it's uh, reverted, of course, to a tremendous degree of inequality in the society, it nonetheless uh, has a what seems to me to be a saner view of uh, cooperation. They speak of it directly at, at, on the, at the international level. And uh, to what extent we uh, as a movement uh, can uh, relate, relate to that, I mean, constructive criticism or, or endorsement or, or, or whatever, and, but, but more generally, how any transformation that uh, is uh, taking place uh, in a country like the United States relates to the changes in the rest of the world. And I especially admire in this connection uh, the, your rootedness in the indigenous community in your area. I think that provides an excellent model. So I, I would say in general that I'm inspired by all you're doing. And I'm just curious about these things, but recognize that it's, it's too big a thing to uh, carry off all at once. But I, I wish you a good conference and maybe I'll be able to tune into parts of it. Thank you. Yeah, Victor, that's a, such a rich comment. I think it's a reminder as we are at 848 tonight, Eastern Standard, that some of these final questions may not get fully answered, but can maybe be taken down and, you know, played forward into the conference, into the, you know, ongoing conversations we're going to have. Not to say that our guests won't have a chance to respond, but I think it's as much about taking questions for the, for the future as it is answering them right now. Um, in the time we have, maybe we do want to wrap up by nine o'clock Eastern Standard here, which gives us 11 minutes to take Rachel's question. And um, and uh, is he, am, am I seeing him here anymore? I think he might have fallen off. So maybe it's just Rachel's question, unless I'm going blind. Rachel, uh, I think you get the last word here, or the last Thank question. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for letting me ask one more question. I feel like I could ask a million. Um, but I wanted to ask about language that seems like it has its roots in challenges to capitalism and alternatives, or at the very least separation from capitalism, language like disruption, like sharing, like artisan, that have actually like become co-opted by corporate speak and used to like really insidious ends. So I just wanted to ask like what problems that poses and also sort of what we can do to reclaim that and sort of take their like true authentic meanings and the possibilities that open up. Great stuff, lots lots there to, to uh, pick from. And actually Brian Gibbons wrote me a, a question privately. I think he meant for the group, is Mondragon Corporation uh, and the work, you know, the Corporation and Federation of Worker Cooperatives based in the Basque region of Spain, an example of post-capitalism. Um, not to not to hitch Rachel's question formally to that, but as an example, you know, of, of the future prospects for this form. Okay, uh, lots there. I don't know what um, Nicola and David would like to respond to directly and what you might just want to uh, save for later uh, and put in your, you know, put in your, 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 your Praxis packet, uh, but there's a lot there. What do you think? The Praxis packet is forever growing. Um, there's so much, and I'm glad that people are recognizing that we're touching on pieces that will be discussed this weekend at the Post-Capitalism Conference. So if there's something that you're really interested in, there will be full panels about a lot of the topics that we've been discussing. Uh, as Victor was bringing up earlier about what's happening with prisons, I just wanted to highlight that on Sunday, we do have um, a solidarity, uh, the prisoner solidarity organizing during a pandemic panel, which will be an opportunity for people to kind of think about like prisons, which is such a fundamental part of how we think about like we talked about incarceration, we talked about policing, you know, the role that the state plays uh, in our lives. I think that, you know, that's a really important subtopic and that will be discussed this weekend too. Um, but I also 
you know, I, I guess the, the one piece that I'll, I'll kind of cherry pick is just kind of, you know, in the spirit of Earth Day, you know, I was just kind of thinking about like how we had ac across this globe 20 million people in support of the first Earth Day, you know, one of the largest organized uh, single day organizing events in human history. And I just think that, you know, a lot of the challenge of organizing sometimes is kind of thinking about like, yeah, what, you know, what's really like, oh, what does a win really look like? I think anytime in movements or any kinds of you know, actions, people are always asking, you know, what does a win look like? And I think that a win looks like a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But the way that I think it's helpful sometimes for us to think about these things is to try to figure out like, what is our goal? And then let's build the pieces in place to get us to that goal. On a small level, when it comes to labor organizing, I just say, give me the goal and we'll build the pieces. We might not get to our ultimate. And I've got my cat going crazy behind me and wants me to feed her. <laughs> Life in a pandemic, you know, but it's kind of like, like think about where we're trying to get to and let's, let's recognize where the power is because we're all a little bigger than we feel and we all have an opportunity to bring together and ignite change and actions in much more like large scale ways than a lot of times we give ourselves really permission to dream about and so i think that that's really you know something that we should be thinking about in terms of you know moving international or the the work that's happening in humble is very much connected to international actions you know we have seventh generation fund which organizes as an indigenous led uh organization that thinks specifically about what's happening internationally is making large changes on an international level as well when in in terms of indigenous rights. And so I just think, you know, you know, I guess I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I could really ramble for a long time here, but to try to like bring it home, I think we need to not allow ourselves to be stifled by what feels possible and impossible. I definitely believe that we need to be thinking about the kinds of uh, actions that we've seen in history and have goals that we can you know, build towards. And in doing so, you know, bringing in a lot of those pieces of uh, now I'm trying to like capture all of the questions <laughs> in my answer. But you know, like, when we're looking at uh, the ways that there's, there will always be co op uh, attempts to co op the work that we're doing. That's part of movements. Um, but, you know, just kind of in recognizing that there's a lot of work that's here, there's a lot of possibility, and we have a, a legacy of change. I mean, we've got into the place that we are here. So just keep moving, dreaming and believing that we can make things happen. Nicola makes me uh, think about, uh, you know, Che Guevara said a lot of really smart things. Uh, two come immediately to mind based on these final conversations. One, be realistic demand the impossible. Uh, and the other one is, at the risk of seeming foolish, may I say that every revolutionary is motivated by great acts of love. And you know that to me, Rachel, answers your question about language and the co-optation. You know, the bastards are constantly trying to co-opt and commodify everything that we do, everything that we hold dear. And what I recognize is, that's the failure of their imagination. And, and some days I will wake up and think there's no way that we can win. They spend literally half a billion dollars on advertising to continue to brainwash us into uh, this, this whole system. Other mornings I wake up in that same bed, but I get up on the other side of the bed and I say, oh my God, there's no way that we can lose. It takes them half a billion dollars to try to prop this system up, right? Ordinary people are coming together in ways that I think uh, are, are really, truly inspiring. And I also want to lift up that uh, the, the indigenous thread has, 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 has trickled through this conversation for the last 90 minutes. Remember, Chris Peters of the Seventh Generation Fund uh, often says, David, everyone descends from indigenous people. You do too. And he says, you know, your job, David, uh, I feel sorry for you because 
you, your ancestors were pushed off the land and out of right relation with the ecosystem so far ago so that you can't hear the trees speak anymore. But what I'm telling you, David, is when we say that the trees are talking to us, it's not a metaphor, right? Like you are that, like we are that connected. And my job is to remember that. And, and Chris Peters says, it's in your DNA. You're gonna to have to work harder if you uh, have been pushed off of the land and the ecosystem, but you can get back there. The second thing that I wanna say uh, is directly to Victor's point about the pandemic. And I, I saw your interview, uh, Victor, uh, uh, and I think it's really important to recognize that this COVID pandemic has exposed the interstitial space and the failures of capitalism. Like that, we are in a conjuncture that had already begun. COVID exposed it. There is no going back. Even if we wanted to, we can't go back to what was before. And who the fuck wants to go back to that? See, I told you I'd get an F-bomb in for you, Joe. Uh, who <laughs> wants to go back to that, right? I mean, that the, the, the prior pre-COVID was fundamentally racist. It was fundamentally sexist. It was fundamentally class oppressive. We need to restructure this thing. And I want to make sure, because I see that Søren has joined us, that Søren Mudliar will be uh, on a really important panel on examining the intersection of white supremacy and capitalism and really grappling with that phrase, at least in a lot of my circles, is bubbling up everywhere, racialized capitalism. Like, what does that mean? And he'll be joined by Esteban Kelly of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops and Wendy Marshall of the People Strike and Jerome Scott of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. So I'm gonna make sure to go to that one and I would encourage everyone to go to that one as well. And then the very last thing that I wanna just give a shout out to whoever mentioned Mondragon, absolutely the Mondragon. It's the third largest employer in the entire nation of Spain. And it is absolutely a solidarity economy model. It can work even within the capitalist system. Now, as a globalist, I wanna restructure the entire world order and get back to, to a different uh, system, but it like we can literally meet our needs right now using commerce in an industrial society using cooperative economic models. Thank you so much for your answers to these questions. Um, and as we wrap up, I just wanna thank you both so much um, for this conversation. It's been great getting to talk to you. Thank you so much. I really look forward to the panel. Yeah, this has been uh, an incredibly rich conversation, uh, as, as Rachel's saying, and you know, th thank you both. Uh, and uh, you know, let's do this again. Avila, maybe we can do a, you know, a, I know you'll be exhausted, I'm sure, after the conference, but maybe we could do a, you know, a, a post, a post op, a, a, you know, a post, uh, a post post a capitalist. Post -post, <laughs> post -post. Let, let's do um, this. Why, why don't we actually uh, schedule some time? I know you'll have a lot going on at Shelter and Solidarity, yeah. but whether you have Nicola or Nicola and I together can come on on a regularly scheduled show uh, so that we don't have to do like I like y'all sure. doing so much. Yeah, yeah, no, we are. Uh, luckily, we, we don't have a show this Thursday, so we can catch our breath a little bit. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to tell you about our upcoming shows in a moment. Um, and uh, and in fact, the, the, the first, but first let me uh, uh, thank uh, my co-producers of, of this show, including Ra Rachel um, uh, who is co-hosted tonight. Rachel, it's been a pleasure hosting with you as well, I want to say. Uh, it's your, not your first time doing it, but first time with me, which I appreciate. Um, also, Sh Shelter and Solidarity wouldn't be possible without the entire Shelter and Solidarity production team, uh, including um, my co-host tonight, Rachel, Linda Liu, and Tim Sheard, Seren Mudliar, Kira Mudliar, uh, Rachel Yarashus Patton, I already mentioned, and Mark Soderstrom. Um, we uh, generally have these shows on Thursday nights, but our next one will not be on a Thursday, will be uh, one of our new weekend shows. And I'm going to kick it back to Rachel briefly for an update on our next weekend show, our weekend edition. Yes, I'm super excited. So on Saturday, May 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be having on Dr. Ranabir Samadar to talk about his book, Karl Marx in the Post-Colonial Age. Um, and on our new weekend series, we're just always going to be talking to an author about a new book, and it's going to be led by myself and our other producer, Kira Mudliar, in the lead, and I hope that all of you come. 
Yes, one of our, you know, one of our, I guess our second Shelter and Solidarity spinoff as we try to be a, you know, a project of projects. Uh, terrific, and it's great the work that Rachel and Kira are doing on that front. Um, after that, May 13th, back on Thursday, our next Thursday show scheduled um, is uh, going to feature and get ready for this. This is this is big in in my world anyway. We'll have Marge Piercy for the uh, the you know the epic you know feminist socialist anti imperialist social justice writer novelist speculative fiction imagineer uh, poet author of tw at least twenty books of poetry a, a long running you know warrior poet uh, in the service of liberation, if there's ever been one. We'll have Marge with us for the entire show, co-sponsored by Monthly Review. This is Thursday, May 13th. Um, we'll be uh, co-hosting that show with Camilla Vai, uh, the assistant editor of Monthly Review. Uh, please join us for that show. And we can really get into a question I didn't get a chance to ask, um, really. I mentioned it, but we didn't get into it. And that is the role of art and poetry and literature and other art forms in, in this mix, you know, which I think is so, so important. If anyone hasn't read uh, The Low Road by Marge Piercy, read it tonight. Um, I think it should be read. It's, it's like a secular prayer for me in terms of hope and hopeless times or what might appear to be hopeless times. Then on the 20th of May, another Thursday show, we will have a show uh, Invisible No Longer, Confronting Anti-Asian Racism and Building Community Resistance, featuring Michael Liu and Kent Wong, um, with uh, Linda Liu co-hosting that show as well. So we have a really full May for you, and we're still putting together our plans for the summer. As always, we are a volunteer-based project. We thrive on your ideas and suggestions, uh, and I mean that for David and Nicola and other members of the, the conference this weekend. Uh, I hope to see you at that conference. I hope that we can continue this cross-pollination. Um, finally, I'll just say we have to thank our co-sponsors, the Community Church of Boston, a free community um, for the study and practice of universal religion, and Cuentro Cinco, affect affectionately known as E5, a movement-building project in downtown Boston, Hardball Press, a leading publisher of labor and social justice stories for adults and children. You can find them at hardballpress.com. The Liberty Tree Foundation, an organization serving the demo democracy movement and the demo democratic revolution, and of course, Socialism and Democracy, a journal that brings together the worlds of scholarship and activism theory and practice practice, I guess to make praxis, um, examining core issues and popular movements of our time. Thank you everyone for being here tonight for a really rich two hours. I uh, hope to see you this weekend and next time on Shelter and Solidarity.